Chapter 11. Expectable Opposition to the Activities of Citizens' Homeland Security Associations Until their message has convinced a significant portion of their communities, CHSAs should expect substantial legal, political, economic, ideological, social, and cultural opposition, as well as extra-legal and even illegal dirty tricks of every imaginable sort. For that reason, from their very inception, CHSAs should first identify the individuals and groups most likely to constitute or to contrive opposition or obstacles to revitalization of the militia of the several states. Second, investigate their mentalities, motivations, and morals, or lack thereof, in order to determine why they oppose revitalization of the militia and when and how their opposition will manifest itself. Third, determine how each of these opponents' likely strategies and tactics can be avoided, neutralized, overcome, or even turned to good account. And then fourth, diligently dissuade, deter, diffuse, discredit, defeat, and dissolve every source of opposition as soon as possible. In contemporary American society, Several groups are likely to push to the forefront of opposition to revitalization of the militia. From the least worrisome to the most virulent, these include National and State Offices of the Department of Homeland Security, the National Guard, State and Local Police, and Local Fire, Emergency Rescue, Paramedical, and similar organized forces that already perform homeland security functions. These entities may come out against revitalization of the militia, and even the formation and operation of CHSAs in their communities, because they mistakenly view the militia as useless diversions of citizens' energies, as unnecessary competition, or even as entities intended to absorb or supplant them in authority or purpose. The best preventative against turf battles and other petty antagonisms arising out of these groups' mistaken impressions is for CHSAs. First, to recruit retired personnel from the armed forces, state and local police, and other agencies with functions related to homeland security. And through those personnel, two, establish liaison and maintain cooperation with those agencies so that misunderstandings do not develop in the first place. CHSAs should emphasize that competition between militia and other organized forces with homeland security functions is a mistaken concern because the status, authority, and purposes of the militia and of these other entities are separate and distinct. For example, the National Guard is an adjunct of the armed forces created by statute whereas the militia are permanent establishments the Constitution recognizes as distinct from the armies and the navy it allows Congress to raise and support, and to provide and maintain. Even more obviously, the Department of Homeland Security, state and local police, and other agencies with homeland security functions are entirely creatures of statute, with no express constitutional status whatsoever. Furthermore, of all these institutions, only the militia can assert an express constitutional warrant for homeland security duties, both in principle, in the finding of fact and law that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, and in practice, in the power and duty of Congress to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, and of the President to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, if necessary as Commander-in-Chief of the Militia of the Several States, when called into the actual service of the United States. The constitutional differences between the Militia and these other entities compel the conclusion that the relationship among them must be complementary, not competitive and least of all, conflictive. 
For example, although as a practical matter, some overlap of jurisdiction, functions, and operations may be unavoidable, in performing their duty to execute the laws of the Union, the militia will supplement, not supplant, state and local professional law enforcement agencies in their day-to-day -day operations, thus facilitating those agencies' performances of their duties where their specialized skills are most needed. To strengthen this understanding, in the minds of these and other agencies performing homeland security functions, CHSAs should carefully explain their goals, programs, and methods and they should regularly solicit advice on their activities and especially recommendations on how statutes designed to revitalize the militia should be drafted so as to minimize friction and maximize cooperation among the militia and these other entities. On the other hand, if some personnel in those agencies obstinately persist in opposing revitalization of the militia on the grounds that it will somehow interfere with their effectiveness, they must be silenced with the decisive rejoinder that if enforcement of the Constitution will thwart the effectiveness of a system of law enforcement, then there is something very wrong with that system. The big media and other public mouthpieces and shills for various malignant special interest groups. Opposition from these groups to revitalization of the militia in general and to the formation and operation of CHSAs in particular will be immediate, unavoidable, and irreconcilable because they want homeland security to remain in the iron grasp of politicians, bureaucrats, and especially the private pressure groups that pull these misnamed public servants' strings from behind the scenes. And that would be impossible if we the people ourselves participated directly in homeland security through the militia, and through our participation controlled homeland security, and through our control determined the direction homeland security took. That being so, the media's tactics will be predictable. Disinformation, detraction, delation, defamation, and demonization. The response to these assaults and character assassinations must be tripartite. First, as much as possible, CHSAs should cultivate friendly relationships with whatever personalities in the media are willing to listen to reason and to report honestly what they learn. The media's worst purveyors of slanted reportage can often be exposed and discredited by comparison to their unbiased colleagues among journalists, columnists, and commentators. Second, CHSAs must seize every opportunity to refute, and whenever possible to ridicule, the canards hurled against them. For example, against the predictable aspersion that CHSAs are populated with, quote, vigilantes, or otherwise engaged in extra-legal activities that supposedly promote violence, must immediately be leveled the rejoinder that nothing could be more conducive to law and order than for Americans to exercise their fundamental freedoms of speech, association, and petition in favor of revitalizing the only establishments that the Constitution itself recognizes as necessary to the security of a free state. and to which it explicitly and exclusively entrusts the responsibility to execute the laws of the Union under the President's command. Third, CHSAs must ensure that the big media does not long remain their community's main or even usual source of information about the movement to revitalize the militia. This should not be difficult, inasmuch as the big media are already widely discredited, distrusted, and disregarded, and increasingly subject to disuse. Alternative sources of information are springing up everywhere, particularly on the internet, and people are turning to them avidly. 
CHSAs, must take advantage of these developments. Pressure groups and politicians, both domestic and foreign, that push for general gun control. The dangers proponents of general gun control pose to the revitalization of the militia of the several states are directly proportional to what they stand to lose if revitalization occurs. Because the militia are based on universal personal possession of firearms by private citizens, revitalizing them will terminate general gun control in this country forever, and thereby will enable the United States to elude or escape from the new world order globalists are scheming to erect on the foundation of disarmed populations confronted with heavily armed pseudo-governments. This, of course, is just as it should be. For Americans, the political regimes globalists want to impose are not true governments at all. As the Declaration of Independence teaches, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And self-defense, as it is justly called the primary law of nature, so it is not, neither can it be, in fact, taken away by the law of society. Therefore, no government can claim, as a just power, the power to deny its citizens the right of self-defense, or the most efficacious personal means to secure that right, either against common criminals or against such political miscreants as usurpers and tyrants infesting such a regime. In parallel vein, as the Constitution, read through the magnifying lens of the Second Amendment, teaches, a true government is the recipient of limited powers from a people organized in a free state, because only such people can delegate legitimate powers to public officials, let alone limit them. And only the delegation of limited powers will preserve their freedoms. And a well-regulated militia, composed of the people, all of whom exercise the right to keep and bear arms, is necessary to the security of such a state, and therefore to maintaining the limitations the people have affixed to the governmental powers they have delegated. So, if a political regime infringes upon the right of the people to keep and bear arms, precisely to render them impotent to enforce those limitations, it forfeits any claim to be any sort of government. They must recognize and obey. For such a regime thus proves itself alien and antagonistic to, and the enemy of, a free state. The only type of state to which Americans owe allegiance. Nonetheless, no matter how self-contradictory and absurd, and in the final analysis impossible to implement, their megalomaniacal plans to subordinate the defenseless masses of the entire world to the armed elitists. Globalists will not simply twiddle their thumbs, while we the people, by revitalizing the militia of the several states, thwart those plots in America. To deal with globalists' rabid opposition to the militia, CHSAs must follow a tripartite strategy. First, they must indefatigably cultivate owners of firearms in general and holders of permits to carry concealed firearms, or CCPs, in particular. Although not all owners of firearms understand why all forms of gun control threaten them personally, ever-increasing numbers of Americans in a majority of the states are rejecting the species of gun control that prevent them from protecting themselves against violent criminals, as evidenced by the enactment in these states of statutes that enable essentially every law-abiding adult to obtain a CCP. The next step is for CHSAs to show these and all other Americans that the militia represent personal protection writ large, and that the revitalization will reduce crime even more than has the prevalence of CCPs. Second, CHSAs need to detach from the ranks of gun controllers those individuals who are simply misguided. 
They should be invited to CHSA's functions, educated as to the constitutional status and role of the militia, and instructed in firearm safety. So they can learn firsthand that what they imagine they know about firearms and their owners in general, and proponents of the militia in particular, is mostly mythological or worse. Third, once the merely misguided have been separated from the truly malevolent gun controllers, CHSAs must ruthlessly expose the latter as the villains they are. General gun control, after all, denies more than every average American's right to self-defense from violent common criminals. It abolishes, as well, their right to personal and collective security from political criminals. No uninformed American can believe for an instant that political criminals are only figments of feverish imaginations of so-called conspiracy theorists. To the contrary, the Founding Fathers themselves justified the Declaration of Independence, and with it everything the states did thereafter, both while independent and then bound together under both the Articles of Confederation and the more perfect union of the Constitution, on the grounds of self-defense against a complex of political criminality, to wit, when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce the people under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government, and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. By every test, what these colonies bore with patient sufferance was a political conspiracy, a design of numerous public officials acting in concert in the British government, worked through illegal means, a long train of abuses and usurpations, for an illegal object, to reduce the American people under absolute despotism. This political conspiracy by itself constituted the justification, it is their right, and indeed created the necessity, it is their duty, for Americans to take up arms, to throw off such government. As the colonists explained, in their Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, July 6, 1775. A reverence for our great Creator, principles of humanity, and the dictates of common sense must convince all those who reflect upon the subject that the government was instituted to, provoke, to promote the welfare of mankind and ought to be administered to the attainment of that end. The legislature of Great Britain, however, stimulated by an inordinate passion for a power not only unjustifiable, but which they know to be peculiarly reprobated by the very constitution of that kingdom, and desperate of success in any mode of contest, where regard should be had to truth, law, or right, have at length, deserting those, attempted to effect their cruel and impolitic purpose of enslaving these colonies by violence, and have thereby rendered it necessary for us to close with their last appeal from reason to arms. And if such a political conspiracy, driven by lust for unjustifiable powers, and in open and knowing defiance of constitutional limitations, could happen once, it could happen again. A possibility recognized even today in congressional statutes. General gun control, and every less inclusive species of gun control leading to it, denies Americans the very implements the Constitution says are necessary to the security of a free state. Namely, Arms in the hands of the people. By arming potential political criminals and disarming their victims, general gun control not only imperils the victims' security in practice, but even negates their freedom in principle. 
Without an effective remedy for a long train of abuses and usurpations, no right, let alone duty, to throw off such government and fend off absolute despotism can exist. A right without a remedy is as if it were not, for every beneficial purpose may be said not to exist. General gun control, therefore, is not a means to eradicate crime, but instead is a program designed to invite, enable, empower, and protect it, and to expand its domain, so as ultimately to make the highest form of organized criminality the basis and source of law for its defenseless victims. At stake is no less than who is in control of America. We the people were domestic usurpers and tyrants who threaten America's national identity as a free state, or foreign invaders, whether in the form of open incursions of enemy soldiers in uniform who threaten her national independence, or surreptitious infusions of illegal immigrants who threaten her national integrity, or the agents of global government who threaten her national existence. For that reason, CHSAs cannot allow the advocates of and apologists for general gun control in their communities go unrefuted and unrebuked. Rather, they must take advantage of every opportunity to challenge these people, exposing in the most uncompromising terms exactly how general gun control threatens every average American's life, liberty, and property. They must aim to make general gun control a matter of debate, then doubt, then distrust, and finally well-deserved disdain, disgust, and derision throughout the community. Corrupt anti-constitutional politicians and the selfish special interest groups they serve. Rather than some futile exercise or mere flight of ideological fancy, general gun control is a sharp-edged instrument scientifically designed specifically to force the great mass of Americans perpetually under the thumbs of self-selected, self-perpetuating elitists. In the foreground, actual or aspiring usurpers and tyrants among public officials. In the background, their string pullers and clients among special interest groups. That these malefactors will always array themselves as inveterate, irreformable enemies of the militia of the several states is inevitable and unavoidable. After all, well-regulated militia are the ultimate law enforcement establishments. Along with the President of the United States, upon whom the Constitution imposes the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed and designates as Commander-in-Chief of the Militia of the Several States, when called into the actual service of the United States, the militia are the only bodies the Constitution expressly empowers to execute the laws of the Union. If individual members of the militia, being fallen and fallible human beings, will always be less than incorruptible, the institutions themselves will nevertheless prove exceedingly difficult to suborn or subvert, let alone to subjugate. For extending across and incorporating we the people as a whole, not simply a few narrow, selfish factions and pressure groups, the militia's authority, powers, and interests will be identical with we the people's. And they will have the strength of diversity. And if, as the Declaration of Independence observes, prudence will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Yet at some point, we the people will no longer tolerate politicians lying, looting, and long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, 
that evinces a design to reduce common Americans under absolute despotism. No sensible American will indefinitely suffer politicians, as either individuals or whole parties, to use the law to break the law under the color of the law, and then to tell their victims that the law demands their sheepish acquiescence in their own shearing and slaughter. So when the breaking point finally arrives, how long will such politicians, by then exposed to all as common racketeers, as well as usurpers and tyrants, remain in office and out of prison, with we the people organized, armed, and disciplined in the militia in every state? As part of their program to revitalize the militia, CHSAs should take the very first steps the militia themselves would take when confronting such false public servants. Namely, 1. To investigate and lay bare their election frauds, corruption, abuses of office, and oppression of common Americans. And on that basis, 2. To demand that these malefactors be removed from office by whatever means the law provides, prosecuted criminally, and sued civilly. This course should be followed, not simply with regard to oppression that has taken place in the past, either, but especially as to the oppression when and as it occurs in the present and in the future. Whenever possible, members of CHSAs, in particular individuals with legal, law enforcement, and journalistic credentials and experience, should appear at the scenes of new outrages with cameras, voice recorders, and other equipment to document in painstaking detail exactly what is transpiring and who is responsible, before the perpetrators and their henchmen can contrive some cover-up. Then, when appropriate, they should file civil and criminal complaints and provide evidence in legal proceedings initiated by others, as well as in the court of public opinion. This will educate the public as to what is really going on by illuminating these rogue officeholders' true characters and conduct, and will identify, properly vilify, and possibly remove from office the worst of the political gangsters. And it will demonstrate in small measure what the militia could do to fumigate the government, and therefore why they must be revitalized without delay. It will expose rogue politicians' opposition to revitalization of the militia as their admission by conduct of their justifiable fear of a government we the people actually control, and thus provide the strongest possible argument for revitalizing the militia as quickly as thoroughly possible, and enhance the credibility of CHSAs and the movement to revitalize the militia, encouraging the involvement of more and more Americans therein. In this work, CHSAs must remain scrupulously nonpartisan. Inevitably, exposure of crooked politicians will help honest ones. But in any particular case, the latter cannot be the dominant purpose for the former. In their capacity as militia, for which CHSAs function as advocates, we the people are to execute the laws to which end, investigation of public officials and politicians' suspicious conduct is necessary, and participation in the inquiry by members of CHSAs is appropriate. Rogue governmental agencies. CHSAs can expect to become the targets of extralegal and illegal harassment from rogue intelligence, investigatory, and law enforcement agencies. The adjective rogue indicates that these agencies, inasmuch as political gangsters, will not sit still while we the people expose their misbehavior and work to remove them from office, let alone deliver them to the penitentiary and penury. CHSAs can expect to become the targets of extralegal and illegal harassment from rogue intelligence, investigatory, and law enforcement agencies. The adjective rogue 
indicates that these agencies, although purporting to proceed under color of law, in fact are knowingly and intentionally acting unconstitutionally and otherwise illegally. Rogue governmental agencies, and in some cases private organizations in collusion with them, can be expected to deploy well-practiced undercover operatives and agents provocateurs to attempt to set up and frame leaders and members of CHSAs for alleged crimes, threats aimed at public officials, hate crimes, and kindred offenses. Therefore, CHSAs will need to be particularly alert to black operations aimed at infiltrating, defaming, destabilizing, compromising, and ultimately destroying them, their leaders, and their members. Even if these black operations are ultimately unsuccessful in dummying up criminal convictions, or perhaps any prosecutions at all, while they run their course, they will create a climate of confusion, doubt, suspicion, and fear within CHSAs, divide the association's leaders and members against one another, and drive away existing members and discourage the recruitment of replacements, alienate supporters, and compel CHSAs and their members to expend their limited time, funds, and other resources defending themselves against specious charges, thereby rendering them ineffective on other fronts. Moreover, that scurrilous charges directed at a few CHSAs or a scattering of their members will be refuted in the future, will prove less important than that they will enable the big media at the time to tar all CHSAs as snake pits of supposed anti-government extremists, and thereby to turn public opinion against them and the entire movement to revitalize the militia. This will suffice to serve the black operative's purpose. For if CHSAs are neutralized, the militia of the several states will not be revitalized, and if the militia are not revitalized, the political and economic interests behind the black operations will achieve their long-range goal to destroy the United States as a free and independent republic. If CHSAs cannot prevent all attempts by rogue governmental agencies and private troublemakers to infiltrate them, they cannot be paralyzed by the fear of such activity either. Rather, they must go about their business secure in the knowledge that they have afforded potential agents provocateurs no fulcra about which to turn their levers of destruction. To protect themselves, first, CHSAs must conduct all of their operations with scrupulous concern for not only actual legalities, but also even the appearance of legality. Given that CHSAs promote revitalization of the militia, the primary constitutional duty of which is to execute the laws of the Union, they cannot engage in any activity with the faintest taint of illegality. Second, CHSAs must be clear as to their character and mission. They must never describe themselves as or act as if they constitute militia. Absent some calamitous breakdown in social order or other public danger beyond the abilities of regularly constituted authorities to address, true constitutional militia are establishments. To be sure, pre-existing by dint of the Constitution, yet always organized under congressional or in the default thereof, state statute, according to the principles and practices of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts. CHSAs, distinguishably, are purely private associations, the main purposes of which are 1. to study the problems of homeland security in their localities and states, 2. experiment with various structures and techniques, as to determine the requisite content of state statutes for revitalizing the militia, 3. on the basis of this work, to prepare appropriate bills for submission to state legislatures, 4. to promote passage of these... Four, to promote passage of these bills among public officials and the general public. And five, to mobilize citizens to volunteer for militia duty so as to ensure that the statutes are successfully implemented when enacted. The militia enjoy governmental status and exercise governmental authority. 
CHSAs are merely collective exercises of their members' personal freedoms of association, speech, and petition, and only secondarily of the right to keep and bear arms, insofar as that right and its correlative duty will necessarily be embodied in any statute for revitalization of the militia. Third, as noted before but worthy of reemphasis, CHSAs must be highly selective in designating leaders and recruiting and retaining members. But everyone in each association must actually know, not merely assume, who everyone else really is, and what everyone else's purposes in joining a CHSA really are. For this reason, Counterintelligence committees not only must demand complete resumes and curricula vitae from all prospective recruits, but also must verify the information and references these documents contain, obtain recommendations from citizens of unimpeachable integrity in the community, and otherwise conduct research on the recruits' backgrounds sufficient to dispel any reasonable suspicion. Fourth, to seize the initiative in this struggle... CHSAs must ferret out, expose, and dismiss from their ranks as soon as possible any and all agents provocateurs, infiltrators, and other troublemakers. Anything that appears suspicious to a CHSA's counterintelligence committee should be transmitted to legal counsel, and when counsel so recommends, agitators should be reported at once to a legitimate law enforcement agency. In no event should a CHSA or any of its leaders countenance, even in principle, a, prov a proposal or suggestion from a leader, member, or outsider to engage in even arguably illegal activity, whether to maintain friendly relationships within the group or for any other reason. If a troublemaker can be linked to some rogue governmental agency or allied private organization, which will likely be the case if the individual is reported to the authorities, with corroborating evidence, but nevertheless they do nothing, then the CHSA should, one, complain to the public officials who wield jurisdiction over that agency, demanding a full explanation for their failure to pursue the matter, two, initiate a lawsuit to obtain discovery as to what is going on, and to enjoin further improper interference with the association's lawful activities. And three, broadcast the affair to the public through every channel of communication to which the CHSA has access, as an example of why revitalization of the militia is necessary to put a stop to such Gestapo tactics. Finally, because CHSAs will never be able to avoid controversies, they should learn to make positive use of these opportunities. For that, they must become so thoroughly prepared, mentally tough, and prepared for vigorous self-defense that no opponent will want to tangle with them. Thus, they should adopt the porcupine as their symbol and inspiration, invincible in defense. End of chapter 11.